The Solihull factory site has been Land Rover's home since 1948. When you look at Land Rover, you see that Solihull on the badge. Today, it's a 300-acre high-tech complex that drives the English Midlands economy. In LC West Midlands Tiger, local engineering, local suppliers rely heavily upon us. A reliance built on the brand's ability to go global well before it becomes a business catchphrase. If you go through the dispatch records, you see Africa, India, Australia, New Zealand, all the Asian countries, it really did just light up instantly. Land Rover found itself all over the world, and part of that is because the British Empire was all over the world, and so it made sense for the Brits to take their cars to their colonies. You see them in really tough environments, and they built their reputation on being able to survive all of these difficult environments. Sending machines all over the globe expands the brand and also gives rise to a legendary yet completely unprovable myth. It's been suggested that the Land Rover is the first vehicle that more people in the world have seen than any other vehicle. An adventuring spirit captures the imagination but it's the machine's hardcore abilities that make it a household name. Land Rovers are the backbone of British farming, British industry, also the military. Everyone loves them. By the early 60s, however, that versatility isn't enough. To keep climbing the automotive mountain, the brand needs a new machine. The Land Rover station wagons in certain markets had proven very popular, so the idea of having you know, a comfy off-roader effectively was something that they were looking at and wanted to try and achieve. A comfy off-roader sounds obvious now, but in the 60s, SUVs are very different. SUVs used to be trucks and were workhorses, were things that regular people drove and worked on, maybe had on a farm and used as a tractor instead of a tractor. In 1966, Land Rover's engineering team decides to chart a path to the unknown and build the world's first luxury sport utility vehicle. In those days, there was lots of manufacturers throughout the Midlands, and when you're launching a new vehicle, that's the last thing you want is a media to get hold of what's coming next. To keep their machine under wraps, engineers engage in a bit of cloak and dagger work. And they even created a fake company for the Velar Motor Company. And they put the badge on the front and they could drive the prototypes around without people knowing it was a Rover product. The new platform features four-wheel drive, an angular body style and a coil suspension. And the coil suspension system and the constant four-wheel drive was an off-road revolution. Launched in 1970, the newly christened Range Rover becomes an overnight sensation and sets the benchmark for an entirely new automotive segment. And go anywhere means just that. Go shopping, go visiting, go to work, go to school. Range Rovers are so many cars in one. It wasn't just an SUV with some power seats and some fancy stuff added to it. It was the first vehicle that was really meant to be a more premium SUV. The machine proved so popular that it continues to influence the brand today. Inside the Range Rover Design Studio, where Jerry McGovern has orchestrated the look and feel of every model the company has produced since 2006. So we're here in our design studio. You can only see part of it, because beyond there, there's a lot happening. And sorry, folks, you can't see that yet. But we've cordoned this area off, and we've got the lineage of Range Rover. We start with this vehicle. It's quite interesting, because when you first look at it, it's got a certain charm about it. This had a lot of functional thinking behind it in terms of the way it was designed and put together. If you look at the interior, it's actually quite spartan by today's standards. 
the interior might be austere, but when the original Range Rover hits the market, it becomes a powerful statement for British industrial design. In 1971, there was a celebration at the Louvre in Paris, and the Range Rover was selected, and nobody had ever seen anything quite like it. What makes all of the original Land Rover products so iconic is their simplicity and their design. And that's refreshing. That sort of reminds me of the locally crafted, brewed, single source coffee thing that people are gravitating towards right now. I don't want a mocha three pump soy latte with this. Just give me a cup of coffee, please. And it's the same thing with these Range Rovers. They're just simple. The simplicity stems from the machine's function over form mantra. Uh, for example, the clamshell bonnet, which is created here, was done at that time to maximise ingress and egress, maximise ingress into the engine bay, because at that time most people worked on their vehicles. The other thing you'll notice is the very equal glass to body relationship. It's almost half and half. And what that was about was when you were inside and you were going off road, you could see where you were. One interesting little story, but not maybe a lot of people know this, is that what you have here, this is called our floating roof, and you still see it on the designs today. But if you notice here, this panel is covered in vinyl. Now, originally, it would have been body color, but because the quality was so bad, and there was in undulations in that surface, they decided to cover it with vinyl and without realizing, that created the floating roof. Not a lot of people know that, but that's a fact. The Gen 1 Range Rover starts as a relatively simple machine, but with each successive generation, it gets more and more complex. In 1989, it becomes the first 4x4 to offer disc brakes. Then in 92, the brand introduces electronic traction control and an automatic air suspension, both industry firsts. Even the current fourth generation machine gets in on the action by featuring the world's first all aluminium off-road chassis. There isn't anything else quite like it, whether it's the continuous belt line, the continuous floating roof, a certain level of formality combined with elegance. Basically, we have all these ingredients, and what we do is we cut them in a way that's relevant. So the challenge is the new Range Rover really almost defying the laws of physics. How are you going to make a vehicle that's got two feet, 600 mil of suspension travel, yet be the calmest car on the autobahn ever? As the machines advance, so does the Solihull factory that has produced every Range Rover ever built. When you go around the factory, you see absolute respect for what created us, and that's what's really cool, that duality of really understanding the past, but really pioneering the future. Pioneering led by understated passion. These days, the Solihull facility is even more complicated. The brand builds six different Range Rover models, including the SV Autobiography Dynamic, on the same line. There are approximately 3,000 people as part of the team in the final assembly area. The build begins when painted bodies from the traditional Solihull paint shop and the special vehicle operations bespoke paint booth are sequenced together and then delivered to the final assembly hall. It will now take just over four and a half hours to transform the painted monocoque into a functioning SUV. The wiring harness is the first hefty installation. The Range Rover harness itself weighs 56 kilograms, and if you used to lay it out from end to end, it would go from the bottom to the top and back again at Ben Nevis. Ben Nevis is the highest mountain in the British Isles at 1,345 metres above sea level. To hide all that wire, craftspeople add sound deadening material and insulation before installing the interior pieces that you actually touch and feel. 
This is where the instrument panel is fitted into the car, and it's really important to get this right. This is the part that the driver of a Range Rover will always be looking at whilst they're driving the product. To keep all the various options in order, they use a build card system. The build card ensures both the build quality and the specification that the customer has ordered is absolutely correct when the car goes into market. Even at this early stage, the machine is already being noticed. This build car is particularly special because it tells the operator that this particular car he's building will end up being an SV autobiography. With the dashboard installed, it's time to add the center console and then the front and rear seats. While the interior of the machine continues being built up, on the other side of the factory, another team of craftspeople starts assembling the powertrain. Behind me is the chassis area. Here we assemble all the powertrains and lower suspension parts for all the models that we produce. This is where we take the engines, gearboxes and transfer boxes and assemble them together before they go into the final vehicle. They start by swinging the massive dual exhaust system over to a jig. Then add the front differential air suspension and front disc brakes. In a typical day, we can build over 850 powertrains for our assembly hall. Finally, the powertrain is ready for the massive 550 horsepower V8 engine. I've personally been with the company now 35 years. It's been really a big part of my family. My wife works here, my eldest son works here, and also my brother. There's certainly a marketing benefit in saying this product is and always has been produced in the one spot by families who have been working there for generations. And that creates a source of pride that I kind of think has to filter back into the product. How could it not? The factory is full of family connections, including a very special mechanical union. This part of the process is called the marriage station. In the marriage station, we bring together the powertrain, the painted body and the chassis to finish the car. It takes just 89 seconds to bring all three elements together inside a fenced safety cell. The marriage is a precise bit of kit, and then we use DC electric tooling to ensure all the torques that are applied to the car are absolutely achieved on every one of our cars. Down the aisle from marriage, craftspeople add the front headlights, bumpers and wheels before the machine is filled with fluids for the first time. The trimmer final hall, many of the components are scheduled just in time. When you just watch it, it is amazing to see hundreds and hundreds of parts just coming together in perfect formation just to make that car right. It really is cool. At this point, the majority of Range Rovers would be nearly finished, but not the SV Autobiography Dynamic. It still has another entire factory to go.